Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. <laughs> Little Mountain Ranch. I'm really happy to have you here with me today. As you can see behind me here, we are in the middle of some serious renovations. Well, they've been ongoing for almost a year, but we actually have the drywallers here right now doing all of the drywalling in the house. Well, they're not here yet, but they will be shortly. And my house is an absolute dusty disaster. I don't know if you have ever experienced drywall dust, but it is the super fine powdery dust that gets into absolutely everything. And it doesn't matter how well you cover your books and your plants and all of those things, they end up getting dust on them. So I have tried to move as much as I can into areas where we aren't doing drywalling, but the dust kind of just infiltrates everywhere. So we are going to be filming outside today, heading down to the garden. I just took a wander through the garden to see what needed to be done this morning. And I have decided that I am going to put up my bug netting over some of my brassicas. I have actually not used netting on my brassicas before. For the first five years that we were here, the cabbage moths didn't find my garden. But over the last three years, the population has increased each year. Last year I used something called BT, which is a natural insecticide, which actually worked amazing for controlling the cabbage moths. But this year I have decided to try some netting. Generally speaking, you do want to cover your brassicas as soon as you put them in the ground because the cabbage moths can come and lay eggs on your little tiny plants just as well as they can on them when they're larger. I didn't do that because I didn't have any. It just came in the mail. And as you can see here, I just put the hoops up. So these are really cool hoops, let me show you. So all it is, is little sections of tube. I used five for hoops this large. And then there's these little silver pieces that slip over the end like that. So these little silver clips are what attach them together. And what's nice about this is these can be adjustable to the size of hoops that you want and then they just stick into the ground like so. And they're actually surprisingly sturdy. I was a little bit skeptical, but I'm pretty impressed with them so far. And these actually came with clips like this for attaching the netting to this, but I didn't realize when I purchased these that they came with them. So I actually purchased some separate ones that are a little bit more heavy duty. So we'll try both and see what works best. So these ones are like this, little clips. I have used hoops like this before in my garden, just ones that I made from stuff I had laying around the farm. So I used uh, metal straight wire fencing before that actually worked okay. And I made little mini row covers to go over my pickling cucumbers, which due to the really cold temperatures that we are going to be getting in the next week, I might end up doing again, actually. I've also used PVC pipe with little bits of rebar stuck in the ground and then put in just to hold the hoop in place. But this year I decided to try some store-bought ones and I have to admit, I do really like them. So I'm gonna pull out the netting and see how this looks. So we'll pull out some of this netting. So just a fine mesh netting. You can see how thin that is. So this is actually a really good size. There's lots of extra length on both sides. And, um, but I've decided I'm not going to cut it just in case in the future I want to use this on a larger um, hoop system. Okay, so now we'll try these clips. I'm just gonna make sure that I have enough length on this side to bunch around like so. Oh, <laughs> well, those clips are a little bit loose. So let's try the other ones. Definitely sturdier. 
This is the brand that um, these hoops are. And the netting doesn't actually have the brand name on it, but I will link it down in the show notes for you if you'd like to check it out. I'm going to use some two by fours to go along the edge of this, probably with some rocks on them, just to hold them down in case it gets really windy. I actually really like that. I think that looks pretty. So I'm not sure what I was thinking when it came to ordering because I did not order enough. I have an entire row of broccoli, which I find of all of the brassicas is one of the worst because when the cabbage worms get inside of the bro broccoli florette, they're really hard to see. And because broccoli is green, it's even harder to see them to pick them out. And there has been more times than I'd like to admit that I have gone to cook some broccoli that I have blanched and frozen only to find worms floating in it. And that is actually one of the things that really turns people off of growing broccoli um, and cauliflower. Cauliflower is not quite as bad just because it's white and you can see the little worms, but it's one of the things that I hear the most often that deters people from growing it. So I definitely want to cover my broccoli patch that's down at the bottom part of the garden. So this chunk I am going to have to cut because I don't need more than probably 12 feet of it down here. Our shop cat, his name is Boba, got out last night and he wants to go back in. All right, buddy. Good morning, Boba. How are ya? Good boy. You go back in the shop? Boba and Nala are friends. Now we can get back in the shop. Cats are the absolute best thing to have whenever it comes to rodents and on a farm, of course, there are mice. And so our cats do an amazing job of controlling the rodent population on our property. We have our barn cat, Elvis, who lives over there. He actually usually goes off into the forest during the summertime and then comes back to the barn in the wintertime which is fine because the biggest issue with the mice in the buildings actually happens in the fall. And then we have Nala and Boba who live in the shop, Skittles who lives in the garden and this shed right here. And then we have um, Lily and Cleo who are the house cats. So we have cats all over the farm. So, and what we do to protect those, the animals that live in the barn and the sheds and the, and the um, shop is we have little heated houses for them that have um, heated beds in them so they stay nice and warm in the winter time. Okay, I actually really like the way this looks, especially once I tuck in the sides. So I have another bed over here and I am super excited. I don't know if I told you guys this last time, but I just ordered a little tiller from Princess Auto that's just like a little tiny one for doing the rows, like along the edge, not the rows, the pathways, and along the edges of the beds. And I am really excited about it. I'm particularly excited. Oh, hi, Nala. You can come say hi um, about it for the crop garden up here for doing the potato patch. Oh, look, the snapdragons are starting to bloom. Oh my gosh, they're beautiful. Look at the color of those snapdragons. Aren't those gorgeous? I used uh, pelleted seed for these carrots and honestly, I think I will probably always use pelleted seed going forward because uh, you can space it really, really well. So all that means is there's a coating on the seed that makes the seed nice and big. So it's really easy to space them nicely and not have to thin carrots, which is lovely because as we know, <laughs> I do not like thinning carrots, but because these got planted when it was really hot, the germination wasn't great. So I do have some empty space in here. And what I actually did was I just went and stuck a beet seed in each one of these spaces. I also, down the middle of this row, I planted some beautiful California poppies, but these are um, not sort of your typical orange and yellow California poppies. These ones are a rainbow. So there's purples and pinks and I can't wait to see these bloom. Looks so pretty. 
but also the germination wasn't fantastic on these either. So there's a patch there and then a big empty patch here. And again, I just put beets in these empty spaces, but it'll still look pretty with a splash of color in there. So this was the row that I was talking about that has the brassicas in it that I don't have enough netting to cover. Look at all the weeds, you guys. Oh my goodness. The garlic is starting to form scapes here, which is exciting. I love making garlic scape salt. I'll show you how to do that once we are at that point. Look at how gorgeous the bok choy is looking. So I was looking up the difference between pak choy and bok choy, and apparently it's actually only the name. In North America, we call it bok choy, and in the UK, apparently it's called pak choy. This is the best bok choy I have ever grown. It's beautiful. So this is the size that you wanna harvest it at. So I'm gonna be harvesting these and we are going to be using them in stir fries. I'll probably blanch some of it and freeze it. I haven't tried that before and um, see how that goes. But I think what I might do is start another planting of these so that I can have some more in the fall. Because as you can see, I didn't plant that many here. And we also have a whole bunch of radishes, breakfast radishes to harvest here. Look at that cutie. So we don't actually like radishes raw in our house, but we do like them baked in the oven. Totally changes the flavor. So we'll pick a whole bunch of these and bring them up. Actually, we'll pick them all because they are going to start splitting. So I just planted them in between my celery because celery is pretty slow growing and won't be ready to harvest until the early fall. So I had some space in between to fill. So put some radishes in there. I have snapdragons planted in behind here. So these ones were planted later than the ones over there, but they are going to be blooming. Oh, look, look, look. We have some blooms starting, so gorgeous. Oh my gosh, I love snapdragons. And then in behind that, I have straw flowers. And I'm really happy with the way this little herb bed is turning out to the straw flowers seem to really be enjoying the this location combined with the soil that's in there because they are looking a lot more robust than the ones over here in the main garden. My lemon balm is not really taking off at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you can see what's going on with these leaves here. I haven't looked into seeing if this is a disease issue. If anybody knows, let me know. I have a plant identifier on my phone that's called Picture This. It's actually really good at identifying diseases in plants. So I'll snap a picture and see if I can figure it out. Yeah, look over here. See, same thing, but not on any other plants, just on the lemon balm. Hmm, strange. So <laughs> one small issue, and I did not expect this. So as you can see, back over here, I have mint growing. And mint can be super duper invasive, but it tends to not be quite as invasive in a northern garden as it is in um, more southern places. However, it's still very opportunistic. <laughs> and I planted this bed, which is, fairly high, as you can see, over top of where I had some mint coming up. And wouldn't you know, the little roots from way down underneath here have grown all the way up through the soil and are starting to come out. These are ones that I just pulled out, but you can see that are starting to come out in this bed. So I may end up needing to move this bed for next year because otherwise it's going to be entirely infested with mint, which is too bad because I really like the location of this bed in front of the greenhouse. But that just won't do to just have this completely filled with mint. Good grief. It is now time to go milk my cow. So we're gonna go up and milk the cow. The other thing that I want to do this morning is go and check on my beehives. Normally I would wait for a sunnier day just because all the bees are usually out of the hive or lots of the bees are out of the hive foraging when it's a nice bright day and not kind of rainy and overcast like this. But I have been putting it off for the last week and I really need to get in there and make sure that they don't need another super on top. I do have one hive that is looking 
definitely less robust than my other hive and I'm a little bit concerned that maybe the queen isn't there or not doing her job. So we're gonna go and take a look and see if there's an issue. Look at how pretty that looks. I love it. What I don't love is this plastic along the edge of my garden, but it is doing a really good job of keeping the quack grass from this side from going in to the garden. And I did plant a couple of um, pumpkin plants kind of in it to hopefully cover it up um, as the summer progresses. So this weather, my friends, I'm Canadian, so I talk about the weather all the time. It's just something that we do up here. But this weather is crazy. So we had that heat wave and then it kind of cooled off a little bit, but still incredibly dry. And now we're getting lots of rain in the next week, which is fantastic. I have no complaints about that, but we are getting well under 10 degrees every single night, which is not ideal when it comes to tomatoes. I don't even have very many tomatoes actually forming on my plants in the high tunnel right now. And last year, Maybe it was last year, I think it was. I actually had tomatoes ripening in uh, by the end of June and I was eating tomatoes at the end of June, which I did push it a little bit by starting my tomato plants really early, which I kind of am regretting not doing this year, but hopefully we'll still end up with a de decent um, tomato harvest this year. The way we have always raised meat birds here is in little ch chicken tractors like this and then we move it a couple of times a day. But honestly, this is the first year we've ever done it this way with this large pen and then just the chicken tractor with an open side so that they can get in out of the rain and out of the sun and all of that. And I won't ever do them any other way ever again. One of the things that's pretty gross about raising meat birds is the smell. They smell absolutely awful. And we have not had an issue with the smell with this setup at all. So we've been leaving them here. I imagine we'll probably leave them here for another couple of days and then we'll move them to a new area. The nice thing is the manure is not so concentrated. Hey, 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 Oakley, no, come here. Oakley, come. Good boy. Oh, this pup, you guys, he is amazing. Oakley, come on. Stubborn as great Pyrenees tend to be though. Good morning, sweet boy. How are you? He's such a good boy. Oh my gosh, you guys, he is just the most incredible pup. So wonderful. Just an absolute little love muffin. He now completely free ranges on the property without supervision. That's how much we trust this little dude who's only four months old, um, which is pretty unusual, but Maple was also like that. She was just really, really good and she has trained this young man. He does occasionally chase after a chicken, like you saw him do there, but <laughs> you're so sweet. Oh my gosh, he's so sweet. But um, he, yeah, he hasn't killed anything and he hasn't even come close. And all we have to do is give him like a little bit of a holler, like, hey dude, that's enough of that. And he stops. We have our turkeys in here as well with our meat birds and they are doing awesome and they're doing awesome so they'll be in here all the way probably until the end of september before we butcher them but these guys only have probably i'd say three more weeks before we will end up processing them we did butcher uh, five pigs and a steer the other day and it went really, really well. Now we have three freezers full of pork. Our steer is still hanging. It'll hang for probably another week or so. I do find that hanging beef uh, definitely does help to just make the flavor better and also have the meat be a lot more tender. So we'll have it hang for another week before it gets cut up. All right, I gotta get my button gear here and get all the milking stuff ready for milkweed. Um, chickens. Hello. This is not where you're supposed to be.
The only pigs we have left here at this point, these five little ones. So these are the last of the pigs and we do have these guys listed for sale. We did consider keeping two of them to butcher in the fall, but we've made the decision that we're just going to sell all of them right now. Like I said, we have three freezers full of pork, so we're probably good for at least until January. Um, so we just decided that we're just gonna sell them. And then this pen here, which is our winter pig pen, we are going to convert into a pen for our sheep. And um, then we're gonna build a little shelter for them under the undercovered spot here for winter time. And then this will be the sheep's uh, winter, path, or winter pen. So one of the, the things that we learned raising Great Pyrenees is that handling them when they have food, when they're young like this, right from the very beginning is a really good idea. So Maple tends to be very uh, food dominant. <laughs> like she doesn't like anyone to go near her when she's eating. And so we have been handling him right from the beginning when he's eating and he has shown absolutely no issues with it at all, which is awesome. No feed. <laughs> See, I love this cow so much. She is a um, milking shorthorn, which was one of the breeds that fireweed had in her. So there's something very similar about them to me, even in the way they look, but also in temperament. So fireweed was never the friendliest cow. She kind of tolerated me milking her. And um, this girl is very much the same way. She's actually just at the point now where I can even pet her like this when she's in the milking stanchion. She would really throw her head around, but she's kind of grown used to it, but she's still a little bit sassy and that cracks me up. I love it. Thank you. Here he comes. There he is. Good morning, Patty. So these guys go up to the pasture now, which is right up here. <laughs> so cute. Okay, so now I just need to get my milk up to the house. When you're dealing with raw milk, having it strained and put into the fridge right away is really important so it doesn't have a chance to grow bacteria. Now, now we are going to get the rest of these guys here covered up with the netting. And then we're going to go down to the high tunnel and I have to do a little bit of work down there. I'll go round up some two by fours a little bit later to get these sides all put down, but now we'll head down to the high tunnel, which is one of my favorite places to be on an overcast day, especially when it's raining lately. It's very peaceful. I wanna show you kind of a happy problem <laughs> that I have in my high tunnel. Look at all the sunflowers that are coming up literally everywhere. So of course, I can't leave all of these sunflowers in here and I should have definitely pulled them out of the high tunnel weeks ago and transplanted them up into the garden, but I didn't, so I am going to do that today. I'll probably leave a couple of the larger ones like this, but all of these smaller ones, I'm gonna pull out. Same with all these guys here because my pepper plants are getting shaded out in underneath. And over in underneath this clump of sunflowers, I have eggplant hiding. And eggplant actually needs a lot of sun, doesn't like to be shaded out, so I'm going to have to pull most of these guys out too. Look at these dwarf tomatoes. So this one's a dwarf, 
These two back here are micro dwarfs and they are just looking so gorgeous. Another sunflower coming up here, but I'm gonna leave that one. I'm going to leave this one and that one, probably that one there. So what I need to do in here is go along and string up my tomatoes and probably do a little bit of pruning, I'm gonna guess. And also to do a little bit of sucker pruning. So let's chat about sucker pruning for a sec. So the reason that I prune my tomato plants is because I want the plant to put as much energy into fruit production as possible rather than growing the green foliage. And because I live in a very short growing season, we usually have frost this last couple of years, the beginning of June, and then we have usually light frosts by the end of August. So it's a very short season. And in order for me to actually get tomatoes, I need to have my plants putting all of that growth energy into growing tomatoes rather than growing the foliage. But one of the other reasons is if you live in an area that is prone to diseases, keeping really good airflow in your tomato plants is really important. The better the airflow, the less likely your plants are to, to, to succumb to disease. So I'll give you an example of lack of airflow going on with a tomato plant. So these are, there's actually two plants here. These are bush style tomatoes. <clears throat> they are determinant tomatoes and they have a predetermined size that they're gonna grow, which is usually around three or four feet. And they grow more bushy, I'm <laughs> sorry, my stomach's growling, but they grow more bushy than they do tall, like these indeterminate Amish paste tomatoes over here. However, as you can see, there's not a lot of airflow that's gonna be going on at the base of this plant. And I'm not as worried about that here because we don't have, I'm not a wor as worried about it in our area because we don't have a lot of tomato diseases here. One of the benefits of Northern growing is there tends to be less disease. But if I did, it would be really important to open this plant up to allow it some airflow. So I'm just kind of showing you what that looks like. You can be pretty aggressive with pruning. For taking leaves off, I find snapping down and then snapping up works really well. But you can see how much more open this plant is already looking. Oh, check this out. Oh my gosh, look, look. There is a little tomato. That is the first tomato that I have found in my high tunnel. That is so exciting. So these ones are, if I remember correctly, Russian orange tomatoes. So that's exciting. When it comes to trellising my tomatoes, as you can see, I have this concrete mesh with T-posts that I use for doing all of my indeterminate tomatoes. But for my bush style tomatoes, I just tie some yarn up here and I just give them a little bit of support like so. And that just helps so they don't flop over. These guys over here actually did not get strung up. And if I were to have strung them up, they would be more like this and all of this growth would be growing up. But since they've kind of fallen over on the ground like that, and because they're a bush style tomato, I'm not gonna worry about that. I might need to put a stake in here just to give them a little bit of support, but they seem to be doing okay. Here's another example that's strung up and I just leave it a little bit loose so that I can just wind it around as I need to, like so. So with a determinant tomato, because they have a predetermined amount of fruit that they can produce, they're not just gonna keep going and going and going, you don't actually need to prune off the suckers with them. So the suckers are these little guys here that are in the crook here between a branch and the main stem, just this guy right here. So with the indeterminates, you don't need to prune these off. I do, however, like to come in and just for the airflow thing, even though it's not a huge, huge issue here, it's just kind of force of habit for me to keep the bottoms of my plants nice and clean. I've already done, as you can see, a lot of the pruning for my indeterminate Amish paste tomatoes here. I keep the stem really clean, quite a ways up, at least six to eight inches. If I notice that the branches are starting to droop and touch the ground, I pop those off. So most tomato diseases will come up from the ground. So 
keeping them from touching the ground is a good way to avoid disease. I am happy to report that ever since we uh, pumped out our spring that the drip irrigation is working absolutely beautifully in the high tunnel which thrills me to no end. I hope it's going to help to mitigate some of the blossom end rot issues that I've been dealing with. So there's two things that can cause blossom end rot. One is irregular watering and not deep enough watering. That's probably the most common cause. And then the other cause can be a calcium deficiency. So I did add gypsum to my soil last year and that can take up to a year to break down enough to be absorbed by the tomato plants. So I'm hopeful that my soil has enough calcium now at this point to mitigate any of the blossom end rot that was being caused by that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then of course with this drip irrigation where I can get really deep watering, that's the biggest thing that I'm noticing the, the difference is that because the water kind of drips slowly, it has a chance to absorb right down deep into the tomato plants when I've dug down behind beside them. I can see that that water or the soil is moist way, way down compared to top watering, where I usually count to about 10 on each plant, but some of that water pools off, runs down the side of the beds, and quite a bit of it actually gets wasted. And with the drip irrigation, that doesn't happen. So I'm an absolute convert to drip irrigation. I would love to have it all over my entire garden if I could. Okay, let's grab some yarn. So I always use yarn to do all of my trellising in my garden. And the reason for that is it is really gentle on the plants because it's soft. And also when I go to clean up in the fall, it breaks super easily. So I can just come along and rip all these plants out and it just pops right off of the um, trellis. So I'm gonna go along this plant, pull off the suckers. Whenever I am in my greenhouse, I get asked about pollination um, and whether we get pollinators in here, how do I pollinate my tomato plant? So one of the lovely things about tomato flowers is they are, pop one of these off, which almost seems criminal. Um, they have both male and female parts in them. So the pollen that forms in it, if this plant is, or if the flower is knocked a little bit, that pollen drops off of the pollen producing part of the plant onto the stamen and that is actually what pollinates it. So all that's required for tomato plants is a little bit of a shake and these um, trellises work really well for that because I can move one part of it and it shakes all my tomatoes all the way down the line. So I just come once or twice a day, give them a little shake and that pollinates them. If you don't have a trellis like this, you can just give a tap at the base of your tomato plant and that will do the same thing. The other nice thing about gardening in the high tunnel is that the mosquitoes don't often make their way in here. Sometimes one or two will, but not nearly as bad as out in the garden. I think I might have squeezed a bush tomato in here because this definitely looks like a bush tomato rather than a indeterminate. Normally I put my bush tomatoes along the side and my or my uh, determinant tomatoes, or my indeterminate tomatoes rather. Oh my goodness, look at that. Aren't peonies just the most beautiful? Oh, they smell so good too. I have made jelly with peony petals before and it's actually really good. Maybe I'll make a batch this year. So now we'll head up to the beehives. I think we'll check the weak hive first and see if there's any brood in there. I have had a hive lose a queen this time of year before. And what I did to requeen it was to take some brood out of my strong hive and put it in there. <clears throat> and then the bees will choose a couple of cells to create into queen cells. They'll feed it royal jelly and produce a queen. The disadvantage of doing that rather than being able to just buy a queen is that that takes time. So I think it's 21 days 
to hatch and then she needs to do her mating flight. That's where she'll fly out of the hive. She'll mate with some drones and then um, she will fly back to the hive and start laying. So it takes quite a bit of time to start building up a hive then. But yeah, this hive is just not looking very strong. So as you can see, not super duper robust looking. So let's get in there and see if we can find any babies. So we have lots of nectar in there. That's that clear stuff that you can see. So what they do is they fill these full of nectar and once they're full, they will fan them off until a whole bunch of the water is evaporated from them and then they will cap them over and that is what the honey is. So you can see this one over here, just starting to cap there. Okay, so I can see the queen. Can you see the queen? That nice, big, gorgeous bee there. So in the bottom of this frame, there's actually tons of eggs being laid in there. So that's a good sign. That is very encouraging to me. So I do know there's a queen. Now we very carefully put this back in so that we don't end up hurting her. Okay, now we're gonna head up and check out the stronger hive. So this is a pollen patty that I had in here over the winter time and I just left it in there. So the biggest thing that aggravates bees is vibration. So trying to be as gentle and slow as possible. So this still, oh, they're just building up this frame. I'll show you this, this is cool. So they're just building the comb onto this frame. It's not amazing. I think bees are so incredible. So these guys still have quite a bit of space left in here. Lots of bees though. So that tells me that queen bee is doing her job. So it's possible that with that other hive, I lost the queen early on in the spring and didn't notice. And then they made a new queen and she's just started doing her job now. These bees are so much more gentle. So again, just building out on this side and on this side, They have filled most of this with nectar and they're just starting to cap the honey on the top. So I am not an expert beekeeper by any stretch of the imagination, but my friend David from Barnyard Bees, he has an amazing channel and he is incredible. He would just be doing what I'm doing here with maybe just a hat, not a suit. <laughs> and that will never be me. I've shared about this before back when I first started my YouTube channel, but I have been terrified. Oh, this one's really stuck. I have been terrified of bees my entire life. And when I say terrified, I mean fully terrified <laughs> of bees. Oh, I don't think I can get this frame out. It's so attached. It's pretty full of honey. So I am actually thinking I'm going to add another box onto this because this is very, very full and I do not want these guys to swarm. Bees will swarm when their hive gets too big. So I want to try to keep giving them enough space. Come on girls, out of the way. Go, go, go. I just find bees so incredibly amazing. Isn't it incredible how gentle these bees are compared to those bees? As far as, like they were distressed if I rattled or knocked at the box a little bit, but um, they weren't trying to kill me <laughs> like the other bees were. The other bees were actually shipped to me from Vancouver. And like I said, this hive here is a local hive. Um, this hive over here, this is actually empty. Uh, my, I lost this hive 
I think it was in March or so. And I was so sad because it was a really strong hive, but I didn't leave them enough feed and I didn't start feeding them early enough. I won't make that mistake again, but all three of my hives did make it through the winter, which is fantastic. That's the first time I've had all my hives. I think it's the first time that I've had all my hives actually make it through the winter. So I'm gonna talk to, I have a beekeeping friend. His name's Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, Carol. Um, that I'm gonna talk to about doing a split on this hive and um, so that I can have three. So we'll see how that goes. So I think the plan this year will be that I'll only be harvesting honey off of that really strong hive and I'll let this hive build itself up and put in a ton of reserves for winter and hopefully we can get it through the winter again and then I can harvest from it next year. <laughs> Mister, what have you been doing? You're so muddy. Oh my goodness. All right, my friends, that is it for us today. I hope you enjoyed today's video and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.